Oh, we're live. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, Garrett Presh, uh, founder of the World Health Innovation Summit, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Mike Vizlowski this evening and his colleague, Sean, uh, Dr. Shauna Padea. Uh, when she joins, she'll be joining us in Scrubs at some stage. Um, she's on. She's actually working at the moment. Uh, COVID calls, and um, we're going to be discussing uh, space medicine, medicine and digital technologies of the future this evening. Um, if you have any questions during the feed or on record, just pop them in the chat bar and we'll take them. We'll put them to Mike and Shauna. Uh, Mike, you're in Canada at the moment. Um, please give us a quick introduction. Tell us who you are, what you do, and tell us about Luxonic and the digital technologies that you work on at the moment. Absolutely. Thanks, Gareth. And, and thanks for, for, having, for having us. Uh, hopefully, Shauna will be able to join us soon. So I'm, I'm Mike Wesolowski. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Luxonic Technologies. Uh, my background is in physics and medical imaging, so I'm an adjunct professor in, in medical imaging here in uh, Saskatchewan. Um, and uh, really, my entire career has been uh, working on new and advanced technologies. So, um, you know, that really led to the founding of, of Luxonic. I spend uh, still some time doing academic research, but my full-time job is, is running uh, Luxonic. So, Luxonic is really a medical services uh, company. So we use immersive technologies like virtual reality to improve access to high quality medical education, professional training and healthcare delivery. Um, we like to say that we're a group of unapologetic do-gooders um, and really our goal is to improve global access to healthcare. So on that front, in terms of global access to healthcare, we just spoke online previously. There's five billion people don't have access to radiology. Is this the sort of you know challenge that we face, and how are you tackling that? That's that's exactly right. Yeah, according to the WHO, there's about five billion people who don't have access to basic ultrasound and X-ray technologies. So um, we're using. Uh, immersive technologies like virtual reality, so a headset like this, um, to really virtualize pieces of the digital healthcare infrastructure. So in our case, uh, my background in, is in medical imaging, and one of the key components of uh, medical imaging is the radiology reading room. So on a daily basis, radiologists sit in front of you know three computer monitors and they review medical images so when you go into a hospital or a clinic you get an x-ray um, that x-ray then goes to a radiologist to review that reading room can cost upwards of you know 30 40 fifty thousand dollars it's fixed in a space um, within a hospital and um, we've thought really there's no reason why you can't take that entire concept all of the equipment that's in that room the the virtual the monitors um, the workstation the telephone um, the medical library and basically put it into a headset like this so the whole idea is we can decrease the cost of the reading room by you know over a sixth so you know a headset like this would cost a thousand dollars or less, uh, as opposed to forty or fifty thousand dollars for a reading room. The other benefit of using virtual uh, immersive technologies like this is they're they're truly mobile, and you can have that same workflow anywhere in the world. And we can connect radiologists from any region in the world together so that they can actually collaborate around uh, those medical images. So as as we are, I'm sure you're audience is aware, um, you know, there's also a shortage of, of healthcare practitioners around the world. So if we can, um, we can connect healthcare practitioners um, from urban centers to rural centers or from different countries together, uh, we can improve uh, ultimately the access to high quality healthcare. Yeah, for those listening in, um, we currently face a shortfall. The WHO predicts around 18 million staff uh, short by 2030, which is a huge um, number, uh, huge challenges in nursing as well. Uh, this puts huge strain on the system. Um, 
I just wanted to talk briefly around COVID-19. How can this uh, technology support, um, should we say, COVID, for example? It, would it be useful in training, um, in simulating uh, pandemics, future pandemics? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great um, point, Gareth. So one of the key issues with healthcare training and education is that it's very hands-on. So there's lots of e-learning tools that we can access over the internet, but if you want a true sort of training experience, you really need it to be hands-on. So how do we do that? Um, and, and again, virtual and augmented reality, these type of immersive technologies are very good at simulating real life. We can put this headset on and it feels like you are in a real clinical environment and you can actually reach out and interact with digital objects within that environment and it fools the brain into thinking you're there. Um, so what that allows us to do is create very high fidelity clinical simulations and those simulations can be used for training. And the beauty of the technology is it can be packaged and distributed very easily. So uh, one of our products, Caregiver, uh, and this ties into the, the space medicine side of things, um, is really a medical school in a virtual reality headset. So okay. exactly, we can spread that around the world. And honestly, the cost of this particular headset, this, this actually fits into your, your phone fits into the front of this, your smartphone. Um, and the cost is under $100. So um, there's a huge opportunity to use this type of technology, especially as uh, the ergonomics continue to improve and the cost continues to come down as the medium to distribute high quality hands on healthcare training and education. Yeah, and, and let me just put that into context for people like so if um, a, a surgeon is performing an operation usually you may get six trainees that are in a room who can actually observe who can stand over and watch the process and um, as you can imagine in a theater it's quite condensed but if you use virtual reality um, you know you can reach thousands and uh, thankfully uh, you know a, a, a colleague of mine Professor Shafi Ahmed is the virtual surgeon and he's pioneering in this field and um, you know the, so there's great opportunities in this space and um, uh, in terms of like because one of the things that we need to look at here is the impact of virtual reality and one of the questions I was going to ask about is applying this technology to the home okay so when we look at how do we improve people's health and well-being, we're seeing a lot of simulations and a lot of, should we say, digital tools being applied um, in the home environment from a gym's perspective in a setting. Mm -hmm. How do you think the future will evolve uh, when we go into personalized medicine, personalized care, a virtual doctor? Right. How will the VR simulate that for us? So we're at home, Alexa, you know, call me a doctor and it's a virtual doctor how do you think that will play out um i really would be really interested to hear what your thoughts are yeah I, I think there's a there's a huge opportunity to use the collaborative aspect of of virtual reality and augmented reality here um you know you and i right now we are speaking over a two-dimensional medium you know ultimately um, i see you on a screen you see me on a screen but imagine you put on the headset and you can interact the same way with another person or very close to the same way with another person um, the way that we do naturally, right? I mean, human beings are, are communicators. We, we are social beings and being able to, from anywhere in the world, um, you know, exist in a virtual environment with other human beings and be able to interact with them and speak with them and and eventually you know see facial expressions and and really have a digital twin that's represented in this virtual space i think i think the there are huge possibilities for at-home care um you know and and it's it's even with subtle things so for example if if in the future you know we have these digital avatars that monitor and and respond to the way that we're moving for example and a physician is able to see that i'm hunched over 
or it can see that you know I'm in pain. It's something that you'll you, you pick up subconsciously. So I think that as the technology improves and we get better and better digital avatars, there's going to be a huge opportunity for this type of interactive collaborative work. Um, but you know, there's also the possibility of integrating other advanced technologies like artificial intelligence. So. Um, you have a mixture of artificial intelligence and virtual or augmented reality. So you can have sort of a hollow doctor that can do a preliminary assessment of a patient. That patient feels like they're talking to someone real, but in reality, it's, uh, you know, an artificial being. And then that person or that artificial intelligence then can communicate with the with the uh, um, the physician, the real physician. That's sort of going into the future a little bit further. Yeah, like so in order, in order to do predictive medicine and so on and so forth. So, I mean, one of the things I was going to ask you is, can you just explain to people artificial intelligence? Um, because sure. it's, it's very confusing for people because we hear about it all the time. Sure. But, you know, I'd like to hear what you think. And, and Dr. Shana um, is, is actually going to join us now. Um, uh, hi, Shauna. Um, we're, we're just in the middle of our uh, discussion around digital technologies, and Mike's just been giving us an overview of VR and the opportunities. Um, delighted you can join us. Appreciate you're in your scrubs and you're working hard um, in Canada at the moment. Um, perhaps we'll, we'll just pause on that question, Mike, at the moment. Sure. Just ask Shauna, just for a brief introduction, tell us a little about your work, and, and then uh, we, we can get into the conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. Um, you know, and they, I, I do apologize for being late. I am working ER today, so you know, it's like a box of chocolates. You never, you never know what you're going to get. So, um, my name is Dr. Shauna Pandya. I am a physician over in Canada. Um, I uh, am also, I work with Mike. I'm the VP of Immersive Medicine at Luxonic Technologies. I am the director of the International it's the, uh, International. Institute of Astronautical Sciences of, and director of their Space Medicine Working Group, uh, along with Project Possum, as well as medical advisor to Orbital Assembly Construction. Um, so I do a lot in the, the austere um, environment and space medicine worlds and definitely happy to chat about that today. So thank you for having me on. No, it's fantastic. Myself and Mike were going through the opportunities and the advantages, particularly from medical training perspective for, you know, VR um, and the future looking at, uh, you know, the digital doctor, shall we say, in your home using the headset and also talking about exercise and so on and so forth. And perhaps it would be really nice if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about space medicine um, and what that entails just it's just a, you know a snapshot for people viewing because it sounds really exciting and one of the things i i wanted to try and articulate in 2019 when i spoke about this at the world economic forum was the fact that we can send people to space for months on end and keep them healthy so if we can apply the same technologies to earth we can certainly improve people's health and well-being Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you asked that question. And so for anyone who, who's unfamiliar with the space flight environment, um, you know, if you take nothing else away from what I'm about to say is that the short answer is that space is trying to kill you. So the environment is incredibly hostile. You know, the, the risk factors include having an altered or lower or microgravity environment, what we colloquially call um, zero G. And so Every single one of us on this planet, all 7 billion of us have had the luxury of growing up in 1G. So, you know, our, our muscles and our, our bones are a bit spoiled because they, they're they gravity loaded. So in, in, in 0G, that they're not. And so they te muscles tend to lose mass, bones tend to lose density. Um, our fluids tend to shift upwards to our face. We feel like we're congested. It actually affects our nervous system. So there's a relatively new phenomenon called the space adaptation neuroocular syndrome. Um, and in addition to all of that, we're, we're still finding out surprises from the space flight environment. At the end of last year, there was a paper published um, suggest with where an astronaut on the International Space Station developed a, um, a thrombus or a blood clot in their internal jugular veins. So that's, that's, those are hazards of the decreased gravity aspect alone. But then there's isolation, there's um, being far from home, there's increased radiation, um, there's the psychology of um, 
being in that isolated and confined environment, as well as the fact that you're trapped in a tin can with your crew and you're away from your family. And then finally, of course, your altered circadian rhythms or altered day night cycles. So like I said, that's a lot of information, but if you only remember one thing is that space is trying to kill you. Wow. Wow. I mean, that, that's a fascinating insight because um, I remember watching a program about uh, doctors who'd went up Everest and uh, they were, you know, basically simulating similar to what you were talking about there, the effects of Everest has on your body, which, you know, basically is trying to kill you. Um, Mike, just going back to what Sean is articulating and in terms of using virtual reality and augmented technologies of the future, how can we learn then from the space environment and simulate that, but then apply that into our living environment? As presume VR is like plays a huge part in that, in the fact then we can simulate these experiences rather than having to actually experience these uh, situations. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And and you know the various uh, space agencies around the world have used. Uh, virtual and augmented reality for training uh, to prepare for missions. Uh, but one of the things that we're really interested in is uh, is is how we how we keep astronauts uh, and their skills um, up to par as they begin to travel away from Earth. So we've uh, been working with the Canadian Space Agency uh, to develop out a caregiver, which I mentioned earlier, which is a, a training simulator which will allow astronauts to upkeep their skills and provide them with procedural guidance as they continue to move uh, away from earth towards mars uh, there are some big challenges as shauna mentioned those challenges uh, for zero gravity you know we have them on the international space station but there are additional challenges as we continue to move further and further out into the cosmos um, and those include um, you know having worse access and communication uh, with Earth. You know, that's one of the big ones. So if you have a medical emergency on the ISS, you can communicate um, with Earth fairly quickly. There's a very short delay. But as we move further and further away, the communication delay is longer. So you can imagine in an emergency situation, you can't communicate with Earth. What do you do? Let's say your, um, your crew medical officer is injured. How does someone who doesn't necessarily have a medical background, how do they actually provide medical care for that chief uh, crew medical officer? So these are the types of questions that we're trying to answer using virtual reality as a training tool, but also as a guidance tool. So using augmented reality, um, so augmented reality basically is a digital overlay over the real world. So imagine you're looking at the real world and in the corner of your vision, you see um, you know, a heads up display that's telling you, uh, giving you procedural guidance or telling you step by step what to do in case of an emergency. Um, these are the type of tools that we're building with Caregiver. Applying that to terrestrial medicine, um, you know, we alluded to it beforehand, we can put these headsets anywhere and we can pack them with knowledge and information. And again, hands-on training is really important uh, when, we're, when we're talking about medicine. Um, so being able to use these low cost solutions to provide training and potentially just in time guidance that's autonomous um, around the world is something where I think there's a lot of potential uh, for this type of technology. And Shauna, I don't know if you want to add anything in about um, low resource uh, environments yeah. and, and how that yeah. relates to space medicine. Absolutely. We're, we're Absolutely. definitely, you we're, know, we're, we're talking, we're talking, we're talking the same talk here, talk here. Um, because um, what we notice in, in this, when we're packing for space is we can't take it all with us. What would be ideal would be to bring the equivalent of another planet Earth with us. But we're incredibly constrained in what we can bring with us with respect to mass, volume, um, how it might be disposed of, if there's any biohazards to dispose of, the power draw, how radiation hard the, the equipment we bring with us is. And so that those are constraints when we pack for space. But I think, you know, regardless of whether you're talking about Everest, like you mentioned, Gareth, or if you're talking about an Arctic community in rural Canada, 
your constraints are actually quite similar. You do not have access to a tertiary level healthcare um, facility, which would be nice, but it's it's not the way reality works. So ideally, what you would like a- be able to bring with you um, is equally low mass, low resource utilization, low cost, low volume. And that's true of space. That's true of the rural Arctic. It's true of a rural village in India. And so the, the beauty of, of some of the technologies we take when packing for Mars is they have application to our most austere, extreme resource and low, uh, remote communities um, here on Earth. And so um, I think it's I think maybe the way with this conversation is becoming apparent is that things that can help us, whether it's for medical education training, whether it's for um, uh, procedural guidance, as Mike was saying, have equal applicability um, on on day to day environments right here on Earth. Well, and that, we, we touched on that just before you joined. We were talking about, um, you know, five billion people needing you know radiography uh, diagnostics for example and um, you know so <clears throat> we, we 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 notice huge opportunities but I, but i'd really like to ask as well and um, because to be a lot you know people who are watching this and watching this on review as well and um, in terms of space and going forward because i certainly believe you know we have to look at where where we go as, as a society going forward how do we apply the knowledge and the wisdom, more so the wisdom that we've learned from space uh, into general population, you know, in terms of sustainable development goals, and then we can accelerate processes to, uh, shall we say, um, sustain ourselves as an environment, you know, because we've got environmental challenges and you're well aware of that. Um, I was just reading today about air pollution and the effects of air pollution on stroke, for example, again, another area where rehab would come in for VR. Um, but I'd be really interested to understand, Shauna and, and Mike, from your perspective, where do you see we can demonstrate value creation? So we always talk about cost, you know, so, you know, if you look at the space, I was just reading a report, you know, space uh, investment, $460 billion, I think it was last year in, in that number. And um, that's a huge figure. And perhaps there's lessons in terms of space and healthcare where we can look at, can we create more value? Shauna, do you want to, you want to take that one? Yeah, just, just, it would be great to get your understanding, Shauna, where you think we can create value in, in emerging nations, because like if it's low cost and we can intervene in Africa, for example, or in uh, India, you know, South America, you know, we can really. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's, yeah, you know, I think I think there's. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. I think. We're just losing a bit of the fade, are we? Um, go ahead, Shauna, whatever suits. Oh. Um, maybe Mike, do you want to take that just just while until Shauna comes back in? Yeah. Sure. So I think there's several principles of of um, space flight as well as just access to space in general that become important here. So the first principle is. Oh yeah, sorry. I my connection's a bit spotty, so I apologize if I was talking over you. No Can problem. you hear me? No okay. Problem. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please do. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Testing one, two, three. We, we can hear you. No problem. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So in answer to your question, there's several principles that become important. So when we talk about, um, you know, selecting for spell for space flight, speaking specifically from a medical point of view, we talk about the most important quality being prevention. If you can prevent a medical emergency from happening in space before it ever even comes close to occurring, then that is a mission success. You just don't see it because it never happened. And so translating that to healthcare, you know, we do need to put a lot more into prevention amongst all populations, urban, rural, first world, first world, developing world. And so that means, you know, giving everyone, as Mike said earlier, access to healthcare. 
giving them access to um, physicians, giving them access to basic screening maneuvers, giving them information information and education, which is akin to empowerment, empowerment about what it takes to be healthy, about nutrition, about exercise, about daily living, about not smoking, um, about obesity. So that's the first part of it is prevention by way of access and by way of education. Speaking more specifically to space technologies that can enable um, every single nation on Earth, it's, it's about using not just human space flight and not just the technologies that come from there, but the uh, telecommunications technologies. Because what we know from Earth observation, remote sensing, telecommunications, satellites, is having that access um, to tracking migrant populations, tracking agricultural health, um, developing added to telecommunications um, capabilities to any country. It's akin to empowerment. And so people say, what is the value of investing in space? Why does Nigeria need a space agency? It's not because they need to send a man to the moon. It's because they need to develop their economy, develop their infrastructure, and space technologies give access to that. And that's why it's worth investing, regardless of the GDP of your country, regardless of the economic development. That's why it's worth investing in space technologies. Mike. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, I agree with everything that uh, Shauna has said. I'll, I will add that um, there are many technologies that are built for space uh, in medicine that we can leverage. So, um, you know, that low mass, low volume issue that we deal with when we're sending things, uh, you know, out of the gravity well of Earth, um, you know, that that pushes technology forward in, in ways that, you know, we miniaturize technology. So for example, building smaller, lighter ultrasound probes, or, you know, I have a colleague here in Saskatchewan that's working on developing a, a small MRI that could be taken um, on a spacecraft. Now, if you can imagine, you know, a, a portable MRI system that you can now deploy around the world, um, that's something that, easily translates. Um, again, it's, it, as Shauna mentioned, it's, it's about providing additional access and having to deal with the constraint of low mass, low volume, low cost for a space mission translates very, very well to providing better access to healthcare using additional, uh, you know, uh, technologies like, you know, portable MRI or portable ultrasound. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know I, I, I was taking part in a recent, um, should we say, high-level advisory committee session on uh, 5G rollout within European Union. And uh, one of the things I was highlighting to them was the opportunity in terms of data collection for predictive medicine for cancers and for predicting from air quality, even from the likes of zero emission buses, which you know, they, you know, because you can then foresee what the demand will be in 10, 15, 20 years when you harvest the data in terms of, well, how do we plan? How many doctors are we going to need? What are the resources we need? So a lot of the data is out there, you know, and I know there's a lot of good technology that's been in use. For example, Azuri, you can use weather fronts, you can use, and this again comes from space, uh, where you're able to then um, know that in the next few days, you're going to have people who admit into ER with hay fever symptoms. So you're going to need specialist registrars on site. So there's a lot of stuff that is out there that we can actually f use from a digital technology perspective. And um, I'd like to ask uh, Shauna, just in the next, shall we say, 12 months, 24 months, because we see uh, things are accelerating very quickly. We've had the pandemic with COVID. You talked about communication and um, misinformation. Perhaps this is something that, because uh, I've no doubt we have a lot of lessons we could possibly learn from NASA um, around how do we communicate effectively because they're, you know, having to communicate at such a distance. Is there an opportunity there from, from your perspective? Do you think we can learn how to foresee these issues? Oh, gosh, absolutely. That's such a great question. Um, and, you know, I think any the flip side of any crisis, pandemics included, is that there's always an opportunity to, you know, prepare ourselves for the 
future and to do do better in the current situation as well as for future situations, um, including pandemics. And so you're right, you're absolutely right. And then what we've seen was um, uh, either a failure of communication, a breakdown of communication, or just the most challenging part of this is the fact that the knowledge around COVID has been changing so quickly that sometimes even what is recommended in terms of personal protective equipment, in terms of who gets swabbed, in terms of isolation has been changing from week to week, sometimes even within the same day. And so one of our key lessons learned is when you have information that needs to be disseminated, particularly coming back to the space flight analogy, of a crew on Mars who, as Mike correctly alluded to, doesn't have real-time communication. Um, You know, the round-trip communication delay on Mars is on the order of 46 minutes. Um, So the key lesson learned from there is how do we enable small teams to, to develop their own infrastructure their own information and do what they can with what they have at the time. And that's true of, of a crew on Mars. That's true of coronavirus. You know, the, the you know, vaccines are being developed. Um, guidelines are being developed at, at the World Health Organization level, at international levels, at provincial levels, and even at facility levels. And coming back to that principle of doing what you can with the information of the time is so providing that information, providing it in a way that's easily digestible and easily enactable, and then also providing a method for for real-time updates. Um, I think that's kind of the lessons that I've learned about using digital technologies and also applying information, both in the era of COVID as well as in the era of spaceflight. Yeah, and Mike, just on this point there, when we come, we talk about social media in this day and age and we look at, you know, future technologies, and one of the things I'm really... I think there's going to be a change in in social media in the next you know 12 24 months i think you'll see new new entries into this space particularly around data sharing and valid data sharing i you know i i I genuinely believe we'll see a shift um do you think there's an opportunity there for say luxonic as a technology company to begin to disseminate uh you know accurate information and one of the things you know if you look at um some of uh, or some of the larger organizations in the world and uh, we are effectively we've opened up a pandora's box and given our data over without any uh, oversight um, to industry and companies who have not in the past acted accordingly um, and we're seeing affiliations with these agencies and we're handing over all this information i mean for me it's a big worry you know because we've got cyber security issues as well um, so I think in the future, do you think there's an opportunity for, you know, new players who are ethical, who are, you know, focused on values coming to the fore? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we can we can talk about um, health data as an example. Um, you know, I think the governments around the world are, are working on solutions for uh, being able to aggregate health data in a way that's safe and secure. Um, You know, we do have uh, opportunities for uh, technology companies to integrate into that data collection, um, whether it's, and and we're seeing it right now with certain companies with smartwatches, for example, you know. Um, But I think, yeah, it's, Data is a very big issue, uh, and I think it's one that is underappreciated uh, by many people. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that we should be in control of our data. And, and as we talked about earlier, um, you know, transparency in where that data goes and how it's used, I think, is of critical importance. And so I think there's opportunities and for companies to be transparent data brokers so that um, you know a person can see where their data is going and how it's being used whether that's health data or you know um, your your internet search history i think there's also an opportunity for for us to 
um, commercialize our own data for for lack of a better term. And I think I think that's one way that we could incentivize more ethical companies to come along and really show that transparency in the data um, brokerage by saying, OK, you, you have this data. Um, if you don't want it to be shared, that's fine. But if you do, here's an incentive. Um, and, and then that's maybe a way that we can um, perhaps more ethically uh, share share data. But it's a very challenging problem. And I don't know if we'll solve it in a conversation like this, but it is something that I think people should start thinking more about um, because it, it is a it is a critical issue for the future. Yeah, uh, my thoughts on this is uh, very simple from a from a health perspective. I worked in rare bleeding disorders with hemophilia patients and 10 years ago, we were introducing um, medical cards with the data and smart technology using mobile phones where the hemophilia patient could then show this to the A&E registrar and they would then treat them with factor concentrate straight away. And the reason for the sharing of information is because it saves their lives. And exactly. then, so I think what we have to have is this open conversation with the general population to explain to them the reason why if I'm from Ireland and I go to Canada and I have an accident and I present in front of Dr. Uh, in front of Shauna and Shauna can access my data like that, then the chances of me surviving, ex, you know, rise tenfold. Um, and I think we need to have that conversation around that's health literacy and understanding. And that needs to be uh, articulated to the to, to the wider public so that we, we kind of show the benefits. And that can, again, have a have a value proposition because you can talk to insurance companies, uh, which will save them a lot of money. Um, Shauna, just to, I'm conscious you're you're in your you're in your scrubs, you're working, you're on the coal face. And um, listen, let, we, we'll, we'll just ask for final thoughts and where you see the next 12 months to 24 months, the exciting times for space medicine, emerging, you know, uh, SDGs. What, what, what's your yeah. focus point over the next 12 to 24 months and, and where do you see opportunities? Sure. And I think actually I'm going to pick off where where you and Mike just left off because we talked about, you know, the, the perils and potential about data. But I want to talk a little bit more about the, the potential, specifically as we talk more about getting to this immersive world of, of, you know, AR, VR, what data layers can we can we add to this? And so one thing that Mike and I have been looking at is biometrics and what that teaches us about learning, about what that teaches us about optimization of learning and stress levels and engagement and concentration. But, you know, if we're going to extrapolate and if we're really going to play the, the, the thought experiment game, what about integrating that into social media and even our handheld mobile devices? So say you're scrolling through Instagram. Instagram already knows what to populate your, your suggested um, photos with because it knows what you spend time on, what you click like on, what you scroll past. Now, say you see something that immediately gives you joy, like a, a cute puppy. Now, imagine that you have biometric sensors that can either detect your eye tracking, your skin galvanic conductance, um, can, can detect the endorphin release. That is powerful. It is almost scarily powerful but that's the era that we're, we're heading into so you know there's a lot of good to be gleaned from that in terms of how we can use that to learn more you know even heart rate variability and what that teaches us about stress about what that teaches us about sepsis what that teaches us about um, how how sick a liver transplant patient is those those are emerging data layers and so this is emerging I think we're just about to hit the the exponential inflection point for such technologies within biometrics and within 12 to 24 months we're only going to see more of it wow that's fascinating because such a what an opportunity that brings in terms of should we say cancers for example and um, you know a lot of it is developed from stress and um, so if we can read those tipping points and um, and we know that they're happening then we can offset them and um, mike from your perspective next 12 24 months uh, where do you see opportunities lie? And uh, from Luxonic's point of view, you know, Sean has given us a good bit of an insight into what you're planning and what you're doing at the moment, which is very exciting. Um, where do you see yourselves in the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, we're in a growth stage. Um, we are 
uh, you know, finishing off uh, several of our, uh, polishing off several of our immersive products. And, and our goal is, is really to, um, to spread this technology and, and to do the most good uh, that we can. So within the next you know, 12 to 24 months, uh, you will see us uh, growing and hopefully you will see us more around the world. Uh, we're, as I mentioned in, our, in my intro, our, our goal is really to provide access to improved medical education, professional training and, and healthcare delivery. And that's really what we're going to do with this immersive technology. Um, in terms of the technology itself, it's going to get cheaper, it's going to get uh, smaller, it's uh, going to get easier to use, and it's going, it's going to continue to be more pervasive. Um, and I think those things only help us in the long run in, in, providing, um, in, in providing better access. Um, I just do, I do want to loop back to the, the data conversation a little bit. I think, um, I think we have to have that open conversation, Gareth. I think we have to really start thinking about the ethics of data. I think that's a very important thing um, because as Shauna alluded to, there's huge power in, in being able to access people's biometrics, but there's, all, uh, there's also a huge ethical quagmire. Um, and this, I think, loops back to space medicine as well, because um, some of the astronauts that we've spoken to, they don't like to be connected all of the time. Or if they are, um, you know, connected to biometrics, they don't necessarily want mission control seeing that data all of the time. Um, so it, it's it's a very interesting question, and I think it's one that we we should have a, a somber discussion about. Yeah, I think one of the things that we need to be very open and candid about is currently what is data used for? You know, that's part of the problem that we have at the moment. We don't know. We just don't know. Like, you know, that's, that's part of the problem. Like, you know, so for example, you know, you go in, let's just say you go and you look at a, you look at a car, for example, um, and next minute you walk across the road and all of a sudden you're getting on your mobile phone car sales, you know, and you're, you're picking up like offers for new cars. Well, how did that happen? You know, um, and this happens all the time. Like, you know, so if you're in the supermarket or, you know, all this. Uh, so we are being tracked all the time. You know, our, our footprint is there. I think one of the things healthcare needs to come to terms with is the fact that, you know, the world is changing very quickly. Health and digital health is changing so quickly. Disruption will occur. You know, we're in the medical space a long, long time between us. We've, you know, we've got a lot of experience. What I see is that healthcare will shift very quickly to prevention uh, yeah. for the reasons we touched on at, at the start is purely down to a resource allocation perspective because we don't have enough medical practitioners, we don't have enough nurses, and COVID will accelerate that process. For example, in the Western world where we have benefited from nurses coming from the Philippines, from Africa, from South America, what you'll see with the COVID pandemic is the fact that, well, that's not going to happen anymore because those nations are going to invest in their own staff because they've realized that they had no staff when COVID hit. And um, we, like, so that's going to happen. So we're going to be in a situation where we need to change and very rapidly need to change to prevention because we'll be hit with a tsunami um, because we've already seen elective surgeries delayed, 28 million worldwide. Um, you know, this will have a knock on effect in mortality rates. Very interesting statistic today, just to let you know, in the UK in the last two weeks, last couple of weeks, over 6,000 deaths alone from cancer. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've millions of deaths a year from NCDs. So we need to put things into perspective with COVID. What sort of future do we do we desire? So I'm optimistic. Um, my final words on this is just I'm really grateful for the two years for joining us today. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to our discussions and how we emerge in the next 12 months and work together on SDG3 for good health and well-being, particularly bringing these technologies to emerging nations and low at a low cost and, and, and helping people. Next week, just to say we have health literacy, Dr. Manuela Boyle will be, will be hosting it from Australia. Um, our WIST talks, and she'll have Dr. Uh, Christine Sorensen and Michelle Ashen as guests. 
Um, so from me, myself, Shauna, Mike, um, just want to thank everyone who's joined the discussion this evening. And uh, we'll, we'll leave you with um, thank you very much. So thanks to everyone and good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.